Oh, Viviano. Ah, Viviano. Chumweka and I were talking the other day about this. It was actually yesterday. And he was saying the night that these guys murdered Guntila Mulea, they actually went to the night, to the food market, the night market, and he was hosting. And he was like, you know, so he was hosting for murderers. What do you mean? You think people that get murdered murder themselves? Welcome to Zambia Water Day. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. We're very happy that you're joining us to take a look at some of the country's biggest news stories. We highlight these stories, and if we can or if we need to, we add context to these stories. A lot of things going on in Zambia, and uh, I think one of the things that people talk about on a daily basis has got to do with the lack of electricity, so that's coming up on the podcast. Former President Ed Galungu's eligibility case, uh, his hearing, is ongoing. Judgment is now being, being set for the 10th of December 2024. I'll give you details into that story. Um, residents of Kanyama Compound are going weeks without water. Nothing special about them because this is happening to a lot of people in Lusaka. So I'll get into detail into that. My name is Dinginda Aba, Jonah Puyoya. Let's set the ball rolling. Different stakeholders have welcomed the application by Zambia's power utility, ZESCO, to adjust tariffs. The stakeholders that have welcomed the move include the Business Coalition Task Force, Zambia Association of Manufacturers, Association of Power Companies, Africa Green Coal Group, among others. Um, uh, Mark Aldenell was representing the Business Coalition Task Force, and he says without energy, there cannot be development. He adds that two hours of energy per day is not sufficient for businesses to thrive. Also speaking at the public hearing, ERB board chairperson James Bandes' approval of the application will be based on its merits. Following Zesco's application for the emergency electricity tariff hike, the Energy Regulation Board has called for the second public hearing this is to allow the public to expand on submissions that they made that would determine whether the regulator can approve the proposed tariff hike. Zesco board chairperson Vixon Ngube has encouraged Zambians to stop massaging the concept of producing power to be sold at a lower cost. This concept of continuously massaging the cost of producing electricity and selling it below cost shall never take it as anywhere. Zesco cannot build reserves that to enable it to invest more because we are already consuming more than we are, we are paying to, to, to produce. That cannot work. No investor, ladies and gentlemen, I shall be blunt with all of you. Zesco has no balance sheet. Meanwhile, private sector players have supported Zesco's application, with others calling for a non reduction of the lifeline tariffs. Energy is development. If we have no energy, we cannot carry out development. Currently, we have no energy in the private sector. We get two hours power per day. We simply cannot run our factories and businesses on two hours per day. Whether you're a small-scale user or a large-scale user, two hours is absolutely unacceptable. We cannot go forward like this. So, we have looked at the uh, proposed tariff uh, increase from Zesco. And I want to be perfectly clear, we 100% support this tariff price rise because we need to get our businesses back to work. We cannot continue like this. Energy Regulation Board Chairperson James Banda says the approval of the application will be based on its merit. The decision will be made um, publicly. Uh, we will make a decision on, on Thursday, the 10th of, of October. When it comes to making this decision, the decision uh, ERB makes, uh, it, it's purely a decision made by ERB itself and the application, as I say, stands or falls on its merits. So we look at the merit of application. Rachel Mumba for Diamond News. Okay, okay. So here's the thing. There's only maybe one bottleneck when it comes to this issue of Zesco increasing the tariffs. And it's got to do with consistency. Because 
Zesco doesn't exactly have the greatest track record of sticking to their word. They will tell you that they are going to supply electricity at such a time and it's not going to be there. They will tell you that they're going to supply electricity for this many hours in a day and it's not going to happen. So that is the only snag, you know, that is there for a lot of people. That if Zesco commits to importing electricity and increasing the cost of electricity for people, the people must actually have that electricity. Because look, if the tariffs are increased and Zesco doesn't supply you the electricity in the, in the manner they've committed, there's nothing you can do about it. That's literally just the situation because we're going through that right now, that Zesco has previously committed so many things that they've been unable to fulfill. And granted, it's be, uh, circumstances beyond their control, but if they're going to now be increasing, that means people are spending more. And you know, circumstances beyond their control is not going to be enough reason to not just supply electricity because now you're talking about people spending a lot more money than they already are so the only challenge is zesco's commitment to delivery because they have had a terrible track record especially this year which is very unfortunate because zesco is one of the companies that has very responsive customer care and responsive in the context that they'll pick up your call but uh, you know so they've got this uh, good customer care of picking up but the delivery of that customer service is has been nothing but you know horrible over the last few over the last few months and, and they know that i mean we know why it's going on but i think that it is one thing to be going through this terrible patch and be aware that you're going through this terrible patch because of uh, whatever reasons but it's another for zesco to not be meeting their end of the bargain and fulfilling their own commitment so that's the worry for a lot of people that's my worry you know if i have to be spending a lot more money but you know it's also a reality that a lot of people are now getting off the grid and finding alternative sources of energy for them to supply their households which also has to be done well because it can also be a risk to your to your homes and your safety so don't get just uh, uncle phil to just do it you know you're gonna, you're gonna get somebody who's <laughs> qualified to do it and they can uh, they can ensure your safety residents in some parts of kanyama compound are going without water for up to a week with some areas facing shortages for months most households in the area remain without running water due to a lack of proper connections earlier this year the disaster management and mitigation unit installed over 50 water tanks in kanyama george chawama and other affected areas to ensure residents had access to clean water as a preventive measure against cholera however Residents are now expressing disappointment, stating that authorities have become less efficient in delivering the essential resource despite the community's continued dependence on it. Uh, let's take a look at this. Drawing water is the order of the day in Kanyama compound as residents push drums, carry buckets and containers in order to have the commodity in their homes. Kanyama compound is one of the largest constituencies in Lusaka and has faced perennial water challenges since time immemorial. The area is densely populated with some places having houses constructed in a way that has made it impossible for water connectivity to be done. However, with government's initiative of erecting water tanks across the area, most have been left at attention to after vandalism or simply have had no water supplied. Water scarcity has been worsened by the prevailing load shedding in the country that has crippled numerous businesses and disrupted routine and mundane activities in a home. Elfi Mwale Shampande, Damo News. You know what? Um, 
this situation has really, really shown people um, snakes bums because it's the worst experience you can you can go through. It's okay, or it's not okay to go without electricity, but I think it's much more bearable, isn't it? But to go without electricity and without water, mm. and you can you can think it's like for people, for some people, it's an issue of when water comes, we're going to pump the water into a tank, in a water tank. That's a very privileged point of view because for a lot of people in these communities, in the communities where majority of Zambians stay, it is just wait for water to come out of the tap. If it doesn't, then we won't have water. And we have to look for alternatives. And some of these alternatives are shallow wells, which are, they're shallow wells, so they're also drying up. And you can just think about that. In 2024, in the 21st century, in this society, in the most developed part of Zambia is Lusaka. And it, there are people right now, thousands, if not millions of people, going days without water. That is a madness. And it's actually so sad when you think, sit down and think about it. It's, it's quite sad that we're actually going through this. And, and, you know, this whole situation that we're going through as a country leaves me dumbfounded because now I'm thinking, you know, with climate change, the weather is just unpredictable. The world is just unpredictable. So what happens if this doesn't actually end as soon as we thought it would? What is going to happen to what is going to happen to the water that people drink? Forget about the electricity. I mean there's a way to get electricity without water. But what about the water? What about the water water that people need to drink? Yo. What do you do though? You know, there are countries that are struggling with water like that. And, you know, this is now we need to start thinking of recycling sewer water for people to drink. I mean, countries are doing that, yeah. The Constitutional Court has set December the 10th, 2024, as the date in which to deliver its judgment in a petition challenging the eligibility of former President Edgar Lungu to contest the 2021 and future elections. When the matter came up for hearing before a full bench of Constitutional Court judges led by its president, Professor Margaret Munalula, the petitioner, Mijelo Zombe, through his lawyer, Michael Mono, argued that Mr. Lungu already held office twice. He says Mr. Lungu will be violating the Constitution if he attempts to seek a third term in office. Mr. Mono has told the court that it is not in dispute that Mr. Lungu participated and won the presidential election in 2015, which culminated into the first term, and at that time, Zambia was using the 1991 Constitution. But Mr. Lungu's lawyer, Bonaventure Mutale, Jonas Zimba, and Makebi Zulu have argued, saying matters relating to the eligibility of their client to contest an election were already dealt with, and in all the cases, the court ruled that his first term into office did not constitute a full term. Let's take a look at this. After hearing all the arguments from parties involved in the petition challenging the eligibility of former Republican President Edgar Lungu to contest the 2021 as well as a future election, the Constitutional Court has since set a date in which to deliver its judgment. According to the court, the judgment will be delivered on December 10th, 2024. The petitioner, Mijelo Zombe, in his petition has argued that Mr. Lungu was not eligible to contest the 2021 and any future election, having held office twice. He says Mr. Lungu won his first election in 2015 and his first term expired in 2016. According to the petitioner, in August 2016, when he participated in the election, Mr. Lungu entered into a new contract for his second term as per amended constitution. He has argued that Zambia passed a new constitution in 2016, during which time Mr. Lungu was already in his first term of office and therefore to attempt to apply the 2016 constitution to a social contract entered into a different constitution is unconstitutional. So essentially in, in, uh, in that judgment we expect the, the court to 
to pronounce itself on um, on the interpretation of of of, uh, of section two and seven of Act Number One of 2016, and whether a reading of those sections um, meant that uh, ECL's first term was bound to the 1991 Constitution. In which case, our argument then is that if it was, then it was a full term. And so, if by 2021 he'd he'd already served a full term in, under the first constitution and the full term from 2016, that means two terms. And essentially, our argument is then that um, then he is barred by Article 106 of uh, from uh, contesting and seeking presidential office for a third time. The Solicitor General Marshal Mujende, in his submissions says Article 106, which was applied on Mr. Lungu in the previous cases, was inapplicable during the transition period. For Mr. Lungu's lawyer, the matter has brought nothing to the court as matters relating to Mr. Lungu's eligibility were already dealt with. They want the court not to reopen the matter. We have restated the issues that we stated in our preliminary issues and also pointed them to specific parts of their judgments where they said that indeed Edgar Chagualungu was eligible in 2021. We do not see them departing from that position. This will be the fourth judgment to be delivered by the Constitutional Court in relation to the eligibility of the former President Edgar Lungu to contest the 2021 general election. Did the former President qualify to contest that election? Is the former president eligible to contest the future election? These are the questions that have been posed to the Constitutional Court and on December 10th, 2024, a decision will be made. Darius Chonya, Damo News. Yeah, so what is... Um I mean, I, I, I personally didn't expect it to take too long because it is, it's pretty straightforward arguments on the Constitution. So it wouldn't exactly take so long. I think one, what I thought would take so long would be uh, technicalities, which have been there, but haven't been so many of them. And um, State Council John Sangwa excused himself because he was... He's, he, was he wanted to make all arguments as a friend of the court, um, but the court insisted that he makes them written. And so he excused himself and, and left uh, court because he wasn't allowed to speak. And, you know, this is like the drama of this case, but it's got a lot of implications for whatever outcome may be. You know, the if the outcome is that the former president, Ed Galungu, is ineligible to contest, presents a very interesting dynamic into what's going to happen in the next election because you will agree with me that he's literally the biggest contender in, in the 2026 election. Why? Because he was the biggest uh, runner-up in the last election. He had 1.8 million votes. That's a lot of people to, to, to vote for him. And, you know, he's the only uh, opposition you know, leader right now who's got the backing, backing of numbers if precedence is anything to go by. And the inverse is also quite something, that if he is eligible, then the 2026 election becomes even more interesting. <laughs> it becomes even more interesting because what we're going to see the, between now and 2026 will be a lot of political theatrics, a lot of drama, a lot of political shenanigans. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, it'll be, it'll, it'll leave, in any case, in any circumstance, Zambians must always have an, a, an, a strong alternative. It's what makes democracy work. So in the context of democracy, Ed Galung would be good for democracy to have somebody that poses as a, as a threat to the current president. But if he's ineligible, then... There's nothing we can do about it. The law will be the law, despite the fact that, obviously, for whichever outcome we're going to see, there's going to be an opposite argument. If he's eligible, there's people who are still going to think he's not eligible. If he's not eligible, there's obviously a lot of people who are going to think he's eligible. And this is because the circumstances have not changed. He was eligible before. 
uh, in an election. So there were people that thought he was eligible. So if he's not eligible now, it's obviously going to, whichever situation is going to have uh, a lot of a lot of arguments to it. And it's a very funny time to be a Zambian. And funny not because it, you're going to laugh about it, but funny because it stresses you, doesn't it? It stresses you that we have to go through all of this. And also just, you know, the ambiguity of the Zambian constitution. <laughs> I've said this before on the podcast, but everything, you know, has got uh, an opposite argument to it. I know that's, that's the idea, but yeesh, the Zambian constitution, you need to have the wig and that black gown for you to say anything about it. But it's in the interest of the citizens. And I think that people should be able to understand it. And when you read this whole thing, it's pretty straightforward if you ask me. But, you know, they come with the technicalities. Because if you listen to the lawyer, Mr. Mijeloji Zombe's lawyer, Michael Mono, says that uh, Mr. Lungu participated and won the presidential election in 2015, which culminated into his first term. And at that time, Zambia was using the 1991 constitution. The 1991 constitution simply men, uh, simply said if you're elected twice you you've served two terms but this constitution says if you, if you are finishing off a term and it's less than 3 years then it doesn't count as a term so yo well 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 let's go let's go let's go let's go delus you've got a question yeah but do you think if edgar Lungu is not allowed to stand for an election does it mean though to be like a front contender, like a strong contender for edges? If Ed Galungu is yeah. is ineligible, yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. Well, then do you think Zambians won't decide who's going to be the next strong contender? Zambians won't. Will Zambians decide who the next? You, well, you know what the thing is. Um, when that happens, somebody kind of falls into place autom automatically. But I also think that. Uh, Edgar Lungu himself uh, is going to play a lot of influence into who the next big guy is going to be because he obviously won't just sit back. He's going to, if he's not eligible, he's going to support someone. And when he supports that person, he kind of starts curating that person's influence. And that person, pe people, Edgar Lungu supporters will go towards that person. So it's just a matter. It's just a matter of asking if that person will be strong, as strong as to challenge for the presidency. But there will be a big opposition candidate from the people that are there now. But it's just whether or not that person is going to be big enough to win the election in 2026 against someone who won with such a resounding victory in 2021. Granted, the country. There's been a lot of shift. With, from where the country was in 2021 for various reasons. And those reasons most certainly are what determine how people perceive an election. So all those things have to come into play. It's, we can't just stick to 2021 because we are not in 2021 anymore. The dynamics have changed. A lot of things have changed. A lot of people's perceptions have changed. The candidates would have changed. And so we need to have a fresh perspective on what the election is going to be like. Edgar Lungu came out of nowhere himself to become president of the country. I know that the context is different because he was from the ruling party then and was not ousting a ruling party. He was from the ruling party, so it was more of a continuity issue. And all of that kind of played, uh, played into him being president. But he did come out of nowhere to become uh, president of the country. And so it is not impossible. I know that there's a context that plays within our politics. There's a context in which our politics are valid. And, and history has shown us that, you know, if you have to oust a government, if you have to overthrow, okay, it's not overthrow, oust, isn't it? Yeah. Oust a government, you kind of need a bit of consist, a lot of consistency. There's no president, there's no president who has just come out of the blues to win an election against the ruling party. Maybe the closest to that would have been Frederick Chilua. But he was also not coming out of the blues. He had a rich history of speaking from the trade unions and speaking on behalf of the Zambian people. And so he built his own ground solidly to, to that extent. But when you look at what happened in taking out the MMD, Michael Sata was a, can was a candidate on the ballot since 2001. And he was contesting every election. 
2001, he, he had such a horrible performance in 2001. 2006, he had a strong performance. He was rising. 2008, after um, Levi Monawasa died, he was also, it was a hotly contested election. And then 2011, that's a period of 10 years of building. But that 10 years of building, when you talk about Michael Sata, is the 10 years of building in opposition. But he had been building even when he was uh, in the MMD. In fact, literature and history shows you that he actually thought he was going to be the MMD president when uh, Frederick Chiluba was stepping away because he strongly supported Frederick Chiluba to become the, um, to have a third term, which was unsuccessful. And so he had this history of being strong. And then you have the current president, Harry Ndehe He was in opposition. He was in opposition when Michael Sata was in opposition. They even had a pact together, an unsuccessful pact leading up to the 2011 election, the UPNDPF pact, which did not work out. So he's been in opposition for a long time. But his strong opposition years were from 2011 because then he became the guy of alternative. But even then, he wasn't like the immediate alternative. Um, he became the immediate alternative in 2015 because then he was the bigger politician compared to Ed Galungu um, in 2015 when Ed Galungu won the election, even in 2016. And that's why you look at those elections that were narrowly won by, uh, by Ed Galungu. So you can kind of see that history has shown us that you need to kind of be in the picture for a while before people can actually believe that you can, you can win an election and make you win an election, unless you're from the ruling party. Because when you look at the ruling party also, Rupia Banda easily won the election. Well, not easily, but he won the election because he was from the ruling party. He was vice president and it was just an issue of continuity. Ed Galungu was from the ruling party and it was just an issue of continuity. So let's see how it, uh, how it pans out. But yeah. The Lusaka Magistrate Court has committed to the High Court four suspects in the murder of former Independent Broadcasting Authority Director General Guntila Mulea. The accused, Francis Chipioka, an accountant and IBA, police officers Metusan Dokowe and Kalib Zulu, and systems engineer Samuel Dokowe are charged with murder. When the matter came before Magistrate Mutinta Mwenya for possible committal, Director of Public Prosecutions Gilbert Piri certified that the case was appropriate for committal and the court has since committed the four to the High Court for trial. Let's take a look at this. The Lusaka Magistrate Court has committed four individuals to the High Court in connection with the alleged murder of former Independent Broadcasting Authority IBA Director General Guntila Mlea, whose body was found with gunshot wounds on the outskirts of Lusaka in July 2024. The accused in this murder, Francis Chipioka, an accountant at IBA, police officers Methusana Dokowe and Kalib Zulu, and systems engineer Samuel Dokowe, are charged with murder contrary to Section 200 of the Penal Code, Chapter 87 of the Laws of Zambia. Particulars of the offense allege that the four in Lusaka jointly and whilst acting together with other persons unknown murdered Guntila Mulea. When the matter came before Magistrate Mutinta Mwenya for mention and possible committal, the prosecution was ready to proceed and informed court that they had the certificate of committal from the Director of Public Prosecutions, Gilbert Piri. The court read the charge and particulars of the offense with powers vested in him. The DPP certified that this is a proper case for committal. Magistrate Mwenya has since committed the four accused murderers of Mr. Mlea to the High Court for summary trial. She has informed them that they will no longer appear before the Magistrate Court because this matter is triable at the High Court. A trial date at the High Court is expected to be set soon as all the four accused await further legal proceedings while remaining remanded in custody, best jury, Diamond News. Finally, uh, the Zambian government has partnered with China's Jinjia, Jinjia International Medical Technology Corporation to establish a vaccine production factory in Zambia with an approximate total investment of, of $37 million. The factory will be set up in Lusaka's, uh, South Mount, Lusaka, South Mount, Lusaka South Mount Facility Economic Zone and uh, it is expected to start the 
um, manufacture of cholera vaccine. Let's take a look at this. Partner with Zambia government and uh, uh, IDC to bring this vaccine to Zambia as part of the first phase of local production, along with the technology transfer and the capacity building. The implementation of this project will provide robust health protection for the people of Zambia promotes uh, local employment and uh, enhance Zambia emergency reporting uh, cap capabilities in face of uh, public health crisis. This uh, project is uh, uh, a resp quick response and implementation of uh, Mr. President's uh, uh, clear instruction. According to the plan, the total investment uh, is will be approximately uh, 37 uh, million US dollars uh, at the first uh, phase with a production capacity of uh, uh, 3, billion, uh, 3 million doses. And later on it will uh, keep uh, expanding to increase uh, more uh, lines, production lines. We believe that uh, uh, this plant, when it's completed, it will be the first uh, cholera vaccine manufacturer in Africa and will benefit Zambia and the surrounding countries. I'd like to see steps that ought to be taken from today uh, towards the factory opening, including the calendar, <coughs> the time frames, so that on the Zambian side, Your Excellency, Ambassador, Ministers, our obligations must not be the reasons that uh, the project is delayed. And this team knows what I'm talking about, because I remind the, my team about this slowness, bureaucracy has no place in a project like this, because it's life-saving. I think this is good, and um, yeah, this is good for us to start manufacturing our own uh, vaccines. Although cholera is a bit embarrassing, I think that what needs to happen more is to make sure that nobody gets cholera in the first place, and and that's by making sure that because you know one one of the things that it shows, cholera is a good indicator of poverty. It shows you that people are drinking unsafe water. It shows you that people are eating unsafe food, that people don't have good storage. And so it's a good indicator of poverty. So if we keep on fighting poverty, then we then the less cholera cases we're going to get. But I think that in the meantime, we all can see that Zambia is a developing country and you know we're not going to fight everything at the same time. So it's a good thing. And it's also a good business opportunity because we're not the only country that's going to have cholera. And if we export, that, that's value that we're adding to the country. Plus, it's a manufacturing plant for vaccines. It's not going to only be dealing with cholera. And I've seen experts also saying that they'll be looking forward to uh, you know, exploring options of us creating some other vaccines. But uh, yeah, this is good. This is some, some, some good stuff coming out of Zambia. And yeah, what a day. <laughs>